Within the understanding of the book of Genesis chapter 6, you have the flood of Noah that occurs. And according to our understanding as Christians today, we believe that it's a monotheistic text that only talks about Yahweh sending a flood. But is it possible that there are multiple voices in this text and that the Bible was originally polytheistic? Find out here tonight on this episode of the Bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament in the veil that separates. What's going on you guys how you doing tonight god bless you thank you for coming to sons of god ministries where tonight we are on part seven of the bloodthirsty god of the old testament and the veil that separates guys before we begin tonight's episode i need to let you know that um this was a tough understanding of scripture to come by this does not just take a couple of days to study you have to study this for weeks months on end in order to start to understand these things because the flood of noah is the most controversial yet the most difficult understanding of scripture that we have ever seen within the bible after this everything else is going to be basically downhill what i mean by that is it's going to be so simple this is the learning curve when it comes to the understanding of the text of the bible the days of noah and the flood once we have a a, a, a good understanding on this we will begin to see these things okay so without further ado let's go ahead and jump into this text and some of this that i'm about to talk about tonight may be a little bit controversial you may not understand it you may not agree with it but i'm just throwing some things out there for you guys to really think about okay so without further ado let's go ahead and jump into this so Last week, if you guys remember, with the Keys of Death, part six of this series, if you have not watched that episode, you need to go back and watch that because that's going to give you a clearer understanding on who Yahweh was versus the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus makes it clear that his Father did not destroy he did not kill people. Jesus was the express image of his father, and in doing so, in being the express image with the same characteristics as his father, he didn't sit there and destroy people. He didn't sit there and annihilate people. The keys of death belong to Satan in the Old Testament. And like we were talking about uh, last week, we were saying that Satan was only attributed 10 deaths in the entire Old Testament, whereas Yahweh, who Christianity today believes as the Father, was attributed over 2 million deaths. You may be saying that God is sovereign and he can do what he wants, but the truth is Satan had control over this world. Remember, Satan offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world in Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4 when he took them up to the highest top of the mountain to offer him the kingdoms of the world that was including jerusalem why do you think when jesus went into the temple he went in there to go ahead and whip out the money changers throw over the tables and send the animals out because he wasn't about animal sacrifice he was not about blood sacrifice obedience is more important than sacrifice so let's go ahead and jump into this now in Psalm chapter 82, there's a lot of people out there that will begin to try to say that there weren't other gods in the Old Testament. They will try to say that the only God was Jehovah or Yahweh. 
Well, here's the problem with this. According to the understanding of Scripture and according to seeing these things, we begin to see something completely different. We begin to see in Psalm 82, the congregation of the Most High God. Listen to this. God, Elohim, El, this is El, which is the Father. Remember, Jesus cried out on the cross, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani. He didn't cry out Yahweh, Yahweh. He cried out Eli, Eli, which is El, El, which is the Most High God. El standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Wait a minute. He judges among the Elohim? How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, you are gods. This is El speaking, the Most High God. This is who Melchizedek served, as we'll figure out here in a couple of sessions. And all of you are children of the Most High, the Most High El. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. What is this talking about? Well, let's go ahead and look at the first verse. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth them among the gods. This is talking about the divine counsel. This is showing that you have the most high God, but then you have the other gods, which are the Elohim, which begins to show us that there is polytheism within this. So the understanding of Greek mythology, Roman mythology, the pantheons of the gods, the Greek pantheons, we got the, the, the this would be the uh, the Norse pantheons where, where you have Thor and Odin and different ones. You have Acer, you, you have the gates of Baldur, you have all these things. And then you even have the Roman pantheons, which is like Jupiter, Venus, Uranus, you know, different ones. They were actually representations of the parallelism of the gods. When you actually begin to look at it, you begin to see it. The Gentiles, which was Israel, which we're not going to get into, uh, in northern Israel, when they went off into the Assyrian captivity, they mingled their seed with the Gentiles. And this is where we get the ancient mystery schools. This is where we get Roman mythology, Greek mythology, North, Norse mythology, all these different mythologies, the cult of Dionysus, all of these things. This is where we begin to see this, the Eleusinian mysteries. We're not going to jump into all that, but... What is being shown here is that there is polytheism within these texts. So if you were following me on TikTok or you've been listening to my videos, here is the case in point. Not only that, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 and 9, it talks about how El, the Most High God, has given dominion to the 72 Elohim, or the sons of God. You see in the King James Version Bible, it says it's the sons of Israel, where it makes it look like men. But in the Septuagint, it's the sons of God. Okay? Now, let's keep on going. So what we're seeing is that there are these other gods. There's other Elohim. The judges were known as Elohim or gods. And then in John chapter 10, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And what is he saying to them? Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. This is when Jesus was actually talking to them and he said that his father and him were one. He talked about how he was, he was the shepherd of the sheep and only through him could men come in. But get this. If we go back to Psalm 82 verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Wait a minute. That's a verse that comes straight out of the book of Hebrews. I believe it is chapter 1. And what we'll begin to see is that the judge of the earth was Jesus because when he defeated Satan, he took the keys of death away from Satan and all dominion was given unto him in heaven and on earth. In Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, we see this. Do you guys see the connection? Do you guys see the harmony within scripture? It's amazing when you begin to look at it and see it. So I had to give you those things right there because this is leading into the polytheistic understanding of 
the book of Genesis chapter 6 through 9 with Noah. Okay, first off, we need to begin to see that there is a lying pen of the scribes. Okay, the lying pen of the scribes was actually inserted into the Bible. Let's read it. How do you say we are wise and the law of Yahweh is with us? Well, certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribes is in vain. The law of Yahweh was made in vain. But the Father is perfect according to Jesus. How can the law of Yahweh be made in vain unless if he is not the true Father? He is not El, the Most High God. Yahweh had a lying pen of scribes. Yahweh had lying spirits that he sent out according to 2 Kings chapter 22. Yahweh had these different things and in accordance with it, it doesn't line up with the harmony of who our Father is and who the express image of the Son is. Now, Genesis chapter 6. What you will see is there's two approaches we can look at within the scriptures. Number one, you can begin to see that the scriptures is only speaking about one God, which is called the Yahweh source. Okay, the Yahweh source, which means that there's only one God being spoken about, which is the monotheistic understanding of scripture, whereas you have the Elohist understanding of scripture. According to Psalm 82, the Elohist or the Elohim understanding would be more reasonable, which is the understanding that there are multiple gods speaking within the text, but because of the lying pen of scribes and because the Yahwehists, they decided to make it a monotheistic script. You see, around the 7th, 8th century, according to the Naked Bible by Marl Baglino, you guys should check this book out. Very good. He's, he's not a believer anymore, but he has transcribed the uh, um, uh, the Hebrew and Greek texts actually in the Vatican. He was a part of the Vatican at one point in time, and uh, he actually uh, resigned pretty much. So this gentleman talks about how um, in the 7th to 8th century, you had the book of Josiah and different sources, which were actually um, Josiah. It Was it Josiah? I, I believe it was Josiah. During that time, they actually took the scriptures and they formed it into a monotheistic text, whereas it was talking about polytheism. We can see this with Moloch, Baal, Asherah, uh, Shekinah, Yahweh. Uh, L, we can see all these things, but what they decided to do was they decided to make it look like it was a monotheistic text. Remember when Stephen was actually calling out the Pharisees and Sadducees with the Holy Spirit coming upon them, he said that you worshipped in the tabernacle of Moloch, your God, with the Star of Remphon. What is that? Star of David today? Uh, uh, Moloch is a representation of Satan. There was only one tabernacle out in the wilderness. We're not going to jump into all that. But basically what I'm trying to tell you is this. There's a polytheistic understanding to the scripture. So what I believe is that according to the Masoretic text, which they actually butchered, which is why we have our King James Version Bible today and our different texts today, they butchered the text because of certain reasons, reasons I'm not going to get into tonight. If you want to go check it out, I have a couple of new videos on TikTok where I talk about the reasons why they butchered the text and what they actually did by butchering the text. Now, basically, what we're going to get into here, one minute, you guys. One thing that we're going to go ahead and jump into is the idea that in the days of uh, Noah, chapter 6, verse 1 of Genesis. Let's read. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. The sons of God, this is not talking about men. This is talking about the angels. This is talking about the fallen angels, which lines up with the book of First Enoch. It lines up with the divine counsel view of Michael Heiser in his book, The Unseen Realm. You see, the only thing I would have to say about Michael Heiser is he believes Yahweh is the true God, which if you look at the acts of Yahweh in the Old Testament, he can't be the true God because he is not the express image of the Son that Jesus shows us in the Gospels. Okay, that's the only problem. I think people need to study these things more. Let's go ahead and jump into verse 2. 
The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord, Yahweh, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Remember, in Genesis 1, we have the true creation, which is the spiritual, spiritual creation, and we have Genesis 2 and 3, which is the natural creation. The Genesis 1 account came from the priestly source of the Elois, whereas the Genesis 2 and 3 account of the earth came from the Yahweh source, which was more the monotheistic source. Okay, And what you guys are going to see is it's not the sons of Yahweh, it's the sons of El or the sons of Elohim, the sons of God, which is lining up with Psalm 82 and the congregation of the gods. But Yahweh was Satan or the devil. I'd rather say he's the devil. But you got to remember, according to Gnosticism, there's seven archons which were created by Yel the Baoth. And in doing so, they took control over this material world. All right. We're not going to jump into all that. But what I'm trying to show you guys here is that you have the sons of God, the sons of El, then you have Yahweh, okay? But then you have El, which is the Most High God. I believe what we're seeing in here, and according to earlier sources of the Eloist, or the priestly sources, you will begin to see that there's two voices speaking within the understanding of Scripture. I'll give you guys a couple of instances. We're not going to read all the way through the book of Genesis chapter 6 through 9. But let's go ahead and go with this, okay? And Yahweh said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. According to our understanding of the Genesis 2 and 3 creation account, Yahweh is the one who created Adam and Eve, but he created them as flesh beings. He didn't create them as spirit beings. Whereas Jesus says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? You see, God always wanted us to be a spirit being, but because of the downfall of mankind, because mankind followed Satan, which, yes, um, I, I don't want to jump into that, but I believe that we are the fallen angels. We are actually the angels that fell, and we're trying to make our way back to God, and slowly but surely, we're getting there. We are the sons of the morning star that shouted for joy. We are the ones that were with Christ from the foundations of the earth that Paul speaks about. Let's keep on going, though. So, okay. All right. This is really about to blow your guys' minds. Yahweh says, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Why is Yahweh destroying man? Because according to him, they were evil. Okay? These were wicked and evil men. But let's see something. Let's jump into um, Paul's writings. Romans chapter 12. Check this out, you guys. You're not going to believe this. Romans chapter 12. What does Paul say? Recompense to no man evil for evil. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying recompense to no man evil for evil. Yet Yahweh saw the evil on the earth, so he destroyed man with evil. Okay? You're saying that's the Father? No, I don't believe that at all. Matter of fact, I believe Yahweh is an instrument of the Father. He's an instrument of the true God. And Yahweh had to wipe these men out because it was by divine providence that El, the Most High God, said that it would occur. You think it was out of the realm of the mind of the Father that Adam and Eve were going to give their dominion over to Satan? That they were going to give these things and be deceived? No, I don't think it was outside of his realm at all. Matter of fact, I believe he uses Satan, I don't want to say to do his dirty work, but I would like to say that Satan, out of the abundance of his heart, will actually give what comes out of his heart that defiles him. Okay, Whereas the Father gives what's out of his heart, which is precious and good gifts because he's a good heavenly Father. 
Remember what James 1.17 says, that the Father of lights will actually give good gifts. Jesus says his Father is perfect. So, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, so we're not supposed to repay evil with evil. Most people will try to say, well, these were fallen angels in the earth and, and God had to wipe them out and everything. Well, what about the babies? What about the different children on earth? What about everything that was going on? Jesus said, if anyone hurts one of these little ones, it's better for him to tie a millstone around his neck and be cast out into the sea. You see, this is the problem with this understanding. Now, in verse 19, we see something here where it says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. How is that? How does that work? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Well, according to the understanding of Scripture, you have multiple gods. You see multiple things going on here. Like I said, it's not outside of uh, of the understanding of the Father that he would use Yahweh for um, for his own perfect will, in other, in other words. But let's keep on going, okay? I need to show you something. But I, I, this is Jesus speaking. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Wait a minute. Jesus is saying the children of your Father. There's a good Father, then there's an evil Father. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. Okay? The Father knew what was going to happen. You see, it is in the realm of Yahweh to pour judgment out. The Father does not need to pour judgment out. But if you remember, the Father, Jesus actually said that he has been given all of control. Okay, so according to the words of Jesus, he's talking about how when you're children of the Father... You love your enemies, you bless them, you pray for them which despitefully use you and curse you, persecute you. Now you got to remember in the Old Testament, this was the flesh. This is a world that was ran by the flesh, whereas in the world of Christ, it's a spirit world. But guess what? Guess what? Satan operated in the world in the Old Testament. The Father operates in the world of the new. But get this, the Father operates as he always is. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means that he always operated out of spirit because obedience is more important than sacrifice. There's a reason why I'm saying this. The obedience comes from the true father. Sacrifice comes from Satan. The pagan deities, the pagan world or the world of that time would actually take the sacrifices that were supposed to be esoteric within you. And they made them into something literal because mankind needs to see something with their physical eyes. I pray that you guys are seeing this. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you the contradictions within the book of Genesis. Okay? Just watch this. Okay? In Genesis 6, we see these sons of God come down, made them with women, creating the offspring of the men of renown, the giants, in other words, okay? Noah begat three sons. The earth also was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. So what we're seeing is, is that I believe two voices being spoken within this, because according to the Elohist source, the priestly source, you can see the two voices speaking. In the first sense, you see Elway, El. El Elyon telling Noah to go ahead and gather two of each kind of animal. And then you have another voice coming to him telling him to gather seven of each animal. Then you have another part where the flood is on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And then the other one is on the earth for 150 days 
or the residing of the 150 days. So you begin to see like this collaboration of these two source texts that were put together or these two voices that are talking. I'll give you guys an instance. In the story of Noah, God says he's going to wipe out the earth. Yahweh says he's going to wipe out the earth because the earth is filled with violence and man is filled with corruption. But get this. At the end of the flood, which is really interesting, what you will see is that Yahweh goes ahead and says that, well, I'm never going to wipe out the earth again, even though man's, even though man is evil in his heart continually from his youth. What, what is the saying right here? There was no reason for the flood. When you really look at it, the same thing that was going on before the flood was the same thing that happened after the flood. There was no uh, re resolving the matter, in other words. What you will begin to see is different voices that are speaking in the text. I really recommend a paper that you guys look into by a guy named Samuel Shaviv. It's the polytheistic origins of the flood of Noah about Yahweh and El. We're not going to be jumping into all this because this is a huge study topic and we'd have to break every thing down. I'm trying to give you guys a high level overview to show you guys these things, but I've studied these things out, okay? It's not like I'm just throwing some random things out there to you guys. But in places in the text, the name Yahweh should be inserted in there. And in, in places in the text, the name El should be inserted in there. This was from the lying pen of the scribes. They tried to make it look like a monotheistic book when it was a polytheistic text, even in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which actually out... out um. It, it, it's older than the book of Genesis or the Eridu Genesis of the Sumerians or the Enuma Elish or different texts or the Epic of Atrahasis. What you will see is that there were two voices that were speaking to Upnapashim or to Zeusudra or Nu or whatever. It was always two voices that were speaking to him. Inki Ia and Enlil. Okay? Now... With that, what you guys will see is that Yahweh said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I thought he just talked about how you were only supposed to bring two of male and female into the ark. But guess what? Some of those were supposed to use, be used for sacrifice. Remember how God doesn't delight in sacrifice? Obedience is more important than sacrifice. So what's going on here? We can see through the characteristics of the guy that's speaking to Noah, the flesh is at work. The flesh is being used at work. Okay? So what I'm trying to tell you guys is this, is that you see these redacted forms of the sources that are coming together, okay? But, get this, the name Yahweh isn't used in the Septuagint. It's the name Lord or Kyrios that is being used, the name God. There are still two voices, but this was trying to destroy the text. They actually destroyed the timeline. The Pharisees, they destroyed the timeline at the Council of Yamnia of the truth of when Jesus would come. Why did they destroy it? Because they knew Jesus was the Messiah. And about 40 years after he came, 40 to 60 years after he came, they started redacting the text. And that's what we have today, known as the Masoretic Text, which is the King James Version Bible. Okay, they took the apocrypha out, which was in the original Septuagint. They took these things out. There was so much deception. Remember, it says the devil comes to deceive the whole world. It's not just during a certain point of time within a seven-year tribulation period. It's talking about throughout the course of time. It has to be. Mankind has been being deceived for the past 2,000 years. It's time that we come out of this deception. Now, even if you guys don't believe me, how can the Father destroy? How can he? Jesus makes it clear in John 10.10, 10, The thief cometh not before to steal, kill, and to destroy. 
You might be saying, well, these were Nephilim giants on the earth according to First Enoch. You're telling me there wasn't a human civilization on the earth in that day? You see, what I believe happened is, is Yahweh was going to destroy the world, and El, the Most High God, told Noah that Yahweh's going to destroy the world, Noah. Build an ark, tell the people. And guess what? The people didn't want to hear it. They wouldn't want. They didn't want to acknowledge it. They thought it was funny. They laughed at him. They scoffed at him. And guess what? Because of that, when Yahweh sent the flood in his own wrath and his own vengeance, which he is Lord, he is Lord Yahweh, the Lord of this earth, the God of this world, according to Paul, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Just because the word God and Lord is being used within the text, does not mean it's always a good, benevolent being. Sometimes it's malevolent. You see, we've been so preconditioned through Christianity, through religion, to believe that, oh, it has to be a good guy every single time it's talking about Lord or God in the text. No, not according to Psalm 82. It's the congregation of the gods. God, L, sits among the congregation of the gods, the polytheistic text of the understanding of the written word of God. But which God is it? The Most High God is speaking, but the God of this world is speaking as well. And he speaks to your flesh. He speaks to the characteristics of this world. Now, Noah was told by El to build an ark. He was told by the Elohim to build an ark. When he built the ark and Yahweh sent the flood, he destroyed all flesh on the earth. Yahweh said that I will destroy all flesh that I created. And guess what? That's not a contradiction according to what we have seen. Because here's the thing, and I didn't tell you guys this, but here's a little nugget of truth for you. In Genesis chapter 1, when it talks about how God created, he created, all right? He literally did it. But in Genesis 2, it says that Yahweh made. There's a difference between the word create and made. To make something means to just use it. All right? It's already there. He basically replicated it. He basically took it and went ahead and molded it into what he wanted it to be, which was a fleshly design because he works off of the flesh. All right. So there's a lot of stuff we get it good get into with the days of Noah. But what you will see is in ver chapter 8, God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuage. You see, according to the redacted versions of the Noah Noahic text of this, what it was is, is that Yahweh poured out the floods, but the true God, El, stopped the water. He stopped the wind. I want you guys to think about something. Think about Matthew chapter 8 when Jesus is on the boat with his disciples and he's sleeping in the back of the boat and his disciples see a storm come on the Sea of Galilee. And when they do, they start to freak out. They say, Lord, Lord, help save us. What do they do? They wake him up. He gets up. He says, how long shall I be with you, O ye of little faith? Then what does he do? He rebukes it. He rebukes the waters. Just like God, according to chapter 8 of Genesis, rebukes the waters. You guys see the parallel? Those waters just, uh, the, the waters that ended up occurring was not just by natural means. That was super, by supernatural means. Satan, Yahweh, was trying to kill Jesus while he was on that boat. And Jesus, because of the power of God within them, within him, because of the power of the Holy Spirit within him, rebuked the waters. That was a direct parallel to the understanding of this scripture right here. He was showing them that he was the Lord. He was the one that rebuked the waters in the days of Noah. Okay. If you go back and you read this, you guys will begin to see some of these things. Okay. But what I'm trying to tell you right now, is that, check this out. Listen to this. 
And God blessed Noah, Elohim blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is going back to the Genesis 1 command. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the earth, and upon all that move upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast why I require it and at the hand of man at the hand of every man's brother why I require the life of man wait a minute this is talking about eye for an eye tooth for a tooth so could this be the true God speaking because Jesus makes it clear that you have heard it said eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth but I say unto you love your enemies bless them that curse you and despitefully use you and persecute you so clearly there's a, a direct contradiction of this so like I said earlier where there's places in the Bible where it says L is speaking it's actually actually Yahweh. And the only way we're going to know this is by the red letters of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, according to Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, for as much then as the children, it's going to go down again, you guys. I don't know why it did that. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. The power of death? He had the power of death because people went into Sheol. He had the power of death because he could kill people in the Old Testament. The Father did not have this power. The Father could not destroy. He could not kill. He was not a murderer. Remember, Jesus says, Your Father is the devil, and he was a murderer from the beginning, from the Genesis. Okay? You're telling me out of all those people that were on the earth in the days of Noah, none of those were babies? All of them were giants? No, that's not the case at all. If they were babies, then that was clearly murder, which is exactly what the father is against. Okay? I pray that you guys are seeing this. Once again, let's read the words of Jesus. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So clearly, what are we saying here? There were two voices that were speaking to Noah in those days. One voice telling him to prepare an ark because the other voice was saying that the world was getting ready to be destroyed in that day. And just like what happened in the days of Noah, Jesus said would happen in the days of his disciples and is even beginning to happen within our own days as well. Why? Because there's spiritual application to all verses of Scripture. I may be a partial preterist. I may be a preterist in the sense that I believe everything that Jesus spoke about had complete application to his own days because he said he would have to come in the same time frame that Caiaphas would see him. He said he would have to come before all of the disciples would get through all of Israel. He said that he would have to come before there were some that were standing there that shall not taste the death. So guess what? There's more to the story than what people see. But there's spiritual application of these truths within the Bible that are playing out in our own day and time. Even if they are geoengineered revelation prophecy, the Father's hand is still omnipotent. He is still the one that is controlling everything. Because guess what? Jesus, our Father, he took dominion from Satan when he died and was resurrected. Thank you, Jesus, for your precious name. Thank you, Jesus, for freeing us from the power of Satan on this earth. So, guys, that is the days of Noah. Now, what we will begin to talk about next is really going to blow your guys' minds. I pray that this has blessed you as it is. I know it was a little bit long. But if you guys would like to support this ministry, you can go to sonsofgodministries.org. When you get to the website, you can go to the donations tab over here off to the right. 
and you can support this ministry. God loves a cherishable giver. Go ahead and give what you would like to give. If this ministry is a blessing and it's been helping you and, and you're seeing things that you've never seen before, then please bless this ministry. Guys, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump off of here. If you can't get to the website page, go ahead and under the link on this YouTube page, you can click the PayPal or the Stripe account page. Okay? Now, guys, I pray that this has been helping you. I pray that this has blessed you. The polytheistic understanding of the scripture is true. Okay, the polytheistic understanding of the Bible was a text of scripture that was used from the beginning. Two voices in the Old Testament the voice of Satan and the voice of the living God, El. And guess what? When Jesus died on that cross for our sins, and he said, In to your hands I commend my spirit, Father, the veil was torn. And the one that tried to separate us from the Father was undone. Because now we have complete control. We can unlock the understanding of the knowledge that Jesus said the Pharisees were going to throw away. We can begin to see within our own lives that only these things alone can make sense. And that we serve a good, good Father. Because guess what? And I'll leave you with this. If a bad father would give a son a piece of bread instead of a stone or a fish instead of a serpent, what more won't a good heavenly father do for his child? With that, you guys, God bless you. I love you. You have a great night.